All right, hello. I know, I know. Good morning, teacher. This is a really great turnout. I know I had some pretty uh, strong competition uh, at this time slot. So thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I'm Grace Prayapong Pisan. I'll say it twice. Prayapong Pisan. Um, I am from Meredith. And I am going to be talking about some really exciting work uh, that we have been doing uh, with the All Recipes brand over the course of the last several years. Um, and uh, I am going to do a little bit of a live demo. So uh, I want to make sure that I leave plenty of time to get through some of the material, have some time for some questions, uh, but really uh, work through all of the um, unpredictable things that happen when you do a live demo. So um, I, uh, I'm going to get to walk through some, some work that we've done, as I said, over the last few years, um, built by a lot of talented people on my team, um, and several of them are in the room right now. So uh, if I have to pause and get some technical help, I've got a lot of good support in the room. So. Um, Without further delay, I'll, I'll get into uh, the content. So the business intelligence team at Meredith um, is a discipline that has been uh, focused on brands in the Meredith portfolio. So I'm going to walk through uh, our journey in building out um, a service that leverages Tableau that really has helped our organization move from what we would consider data-driven to data-forward. So not just data informing our business and describing the health of our business, but data really driving some of our capabilities and product. So um, the, the project I'm going to be talking about is specific to an initiative that we put in place to help our sales team, because uh, when you have salespeople on your side, you can get uh, a lot of buy-in and get a lot of support. So that's one of the things I'll talk about is how we used uh, this particular project to drive uh, increased investment in our uh, data capabilities and increased investment in scaling Tableau. Um, I'm also going to talk through a little bit about who Meredith is. Um, I don't know that many people actually are aware of Meredith, and I was trying to think of a, a clever analogy, but I was thinking about the Olsen twins, right? Everybody knows who the Olsen twins are, super famous, but does anybody know who their parents are? No. So uh, Meredith has some iconic brands um, that are pretty well known, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Meredith and then dive into our uh, process in evolving this product and then, like I said, show off the product. So I've been with the All Recipes Meredith organization for eight years now, and um, in the scope of being in the digital uh, industry, that's a really long time. But in Meredith years and All Recipes years, that's no time at all. Meredith uh, is a 115-year-old organization. Uh, all Recipes is a 20-year-old online brand, so eight years has really given me a unique perspective, perspective into seeing um, how the business has evolved. Um, we started off with a really small team, and I'm sure many people in the room kind of have that same challenge. You start with a small team, you have some grand ambitions, you quickly realize that you kind of have to tap out at a certain level in terms of the stakeholders and how you support them. Um, but our vision was to take this very rich data set that we have across all of the Meredith brands, and Meredith covers brands from food, so all recipes naturally, um, to fitness, beauty, home, parenting. We really wanted to be able to leverage all of this data to help drive direct sales but also help drive our own content and editorial initiatives. Uh, but we wanted to be able to do it fast, faster. So our vision was to bring all of this data together, put a visualization layer on top, build a self-service environment that covers the myriad of topics that uh, we have access to in terms of, like I said, the categories that Meredith covers. But it took time, it took a lot of iteration, and um, a lot of prototyping. So we are adopting a more rapid prototyping approach. 
Um, so you can see in this quick timeline here, and I'll talk through certain milestones in this timeline, but we started this back in 2011. We had, like I said, a small team of analysts supporting our sales team. So if they had a meeting with a particular uh, advertiser or, or agency, we would do some analysis based on food trends that we were observing in the All Recipes data uh, and arm those salespeople with that information to go into their client meetings. We didn't have any developers helping us. Um, and like I said, it was a small team and uh, we had a two week turnaround time. So the time to get the data, compile it, build some meaningful interpretations of that data it took two weeks. And as you know, a sales team, a two week turnaround time might as well be nothing because their sales window is pretty small. So we knew uh, that the two week turnaround time was not gonna be sustainable, um, but when we did have the luxury of that lead time, we were really successful. The data that we were able to provide and the analysis we were able to provide to our, our sellers uh, really were uh, uh, the differentiators that helped them close several deals. And so with that success, the demand quickly outpaced our capacity. So we had some investment um, in our team. We were able to expand our organization. Uh, but we continued to be stretched thin, so we needed to begin planning our autom automation efforts. Um, at this time, we also expanded beyond the food category. We were uh, supporting analysis across all recipes and many of the other brands. So we knew the automation effort had to take place, and so in 2016, we launched uh, the MVP, or the Minimum Viable Product, of what we called our Nuggets platform. So our sales team wanted nuggets of information uh, across our team. We kind of cringe when we call it nuggets because it's not necessarily the most appetizing way to describe food, particularly if you're working on a food brand, but it's the name that stuck. So we're gonna continue to call it nuggets until someone gives us a better name. And if you've got any ideas, I'm all ears. So uh, after you see the demo, if you're inspired by a better name, I, I'd love to hear it. Um, so th this MVP really was successful in helping us uh, shorten that lead time. So we went from a two-week lead time to about three business days because there was a better framework in place. Then this year came uh, the bigger, more monumental evolution of this self-service platform that lets us uh, surface these food insights. Um, and that's what I'm gonna probably focus the majority of the presentation on, on, the, on and on the demo. But um, what's really incredible, I think, about this particular iteration of this product is we went from a two-week lead time to three days to now being able to turn something ar around in about two hours. So we have an expanding team, shorter lead time, much more demand. Um, and then, you know, in, into uh, 2018, we've got a lot of ideas about how we want to expand this. Um, and then just a quick visual on what this looked like over the years. So, you know, on the left, we have a whole bunch of SQL, and this was basically what our analysts were working with. They spent, you know, the majority of that two-week lead time writing a bunch of SQL, hitting our proprietary databases, joining things to different or joining tables across different data sets. But what we knew we had to execute on in that vision was something more visual, something more easily consumable. I mean, clearly the left was not what we delivered to our sales team, but we wanted to be able to take that layer out and be able to quickly get to the visualization on the right. Okay, so before I dive into what we built and the uh, challenges of getting there, a little bit about Meredith. So as I said, Meredith is 115 years old. It's headquartered in Des Moines, Iowa. Its very first publication uh, was an agriculture magazine. So um, Meredith is a leading uh, publisher, primarily focused on print brands. I focus on the digital brands. Um, but yeah, 115 years old, and we focus on uh, the female demographic. So the majority of our uh, audience are women. So you can see we've got 110 million women and that's 110 million uh, women who have transacted or purchased something from Meredith. So people who have subscribed to magazines, uh, purchased something from one of our sites. So that's really our consumer database. 
um, and we reach 70% of millennials. So as I said, Meredith uh, is a, you know, not necessarily a well-known organization, but the brands are definitely iconic. So across the bottom, there are a few of the brands uh, that we represent, All Recipes, Shape, Parenting, Eating Well, Martha Stewart, Better Homes and Gardens. So again, iconic brands with a uh, vast amount of really um, incredible data. And our data philosophy and part of the reason why I absolutely love working for Meredith is that we really think about bringing all of the data and all of the signals that we collect across our online properties and our uh, consumer transactional databases is bringing that consumer journey together. So we think about Meredith brands in terms of uh, being able to address certain life milestones, whether that's over the course of a lifetime from um, finishing school, moving out on your own, setting up your first apartment or your first home, to um, starting a family, keeping in shape, um, to uh, starting a family and um, figuring out how to explore that wonderful world of parenting. So we think about it in terms of that life journey, but then we think more micro in terms of that daily journey. So uh, we like to talk about the fact that we wanna be uh, in front of the consumer during all of those challenges that uh, he or she may experience uh, over the course of the day. So waking up in the morning, checking out Parents Magazine, Halloween's coming. If you want to figure out what the heck should you dress your kids up for for Halloween, uh, Parents Magazine can help you figure that out as you're starting your day and you need to figure out, okay, what do I need to go buy or make for these kids? Um, to get out uh, uh, for your morning workout. So Shape has uh, video content, lots of video workout content, um, to getting breakfast ready for yourself, uh, what to have for lunch, and then three o'clock, which is the dinner crush. So figuring out what the heck are, are we gonna have for dinner? What am I gonna make for dinner? Um, that's our peak, that's about the peak of our, our traffic uh, period on all recipes is that uh, dinner planning hour to actually sitting down and preparing the meal. So we think about bringing all these signals together to understand what people are thinking about, what they are uh, intending to do through the course of the day and why this matters from a retail standpoint, from a consumer standpoint, is that we wanna understand what people are interested in, so what kinds of content, what kind of tasks are they looking to complete, tasks big and small, and understanding what they're gonna do with this information in order to really understand when someone is going to be ready to make that purchase decision. So uh, this particular funnel is something we really like to talk about, and. Um, Interestingly, we ran a survey on all recipes and 50% of the respondents said that they are in a grocery store 24 hours within, uh, within uh, being on the site to actually look for recipe content. So we're interested in that consumer journey, that uh, intent to purchase or interest to purchase a funnel but we are uniquely qualified, particularly on the all recipe side and in the food category because of our scale. So Meredith overall, as I said, we, oh, this is updated now. We now have 125 million consumers in our database. So those are the people that have transacted with Meredith over the last um, several decades. Uh, and on the digital side, we uh, know we have 90 million consumers. So uh, the intersection and the combination of those two uh, data sets uh, form what we uh, consider our first party data. And across that first party data that we collect from the transactions, the uh, clickstream data on our websites, uh, we collect about 25,000 different attributes across um, these consumers. And what does that mean? So from an interest standpoint, we see about 3 million visits or sessions across our digital properties every year. Um, we uh, have uh, about 6 million new registrants to our properties every year. Uh, we send more than 6 billion emails every year. Uh, we have about 50 million entries into a variety of contests and sweepstakes. We have 66 million uh, social followers and 30 million subscribers. So we are able to gauge the interests of a very large population of people. Um, 
in order to understand this intent continuum. So we have utilities that allow our consumers to share content. So uh, on all recipes, we have a couple features called I made it, I did it. Uh, and we use that to build consumer profiles to really understand, okay, of the people that we're seeing on our sites, what is the content that they are moved to engage with? All right. So this data has helped us form some strategic partnerships with several large CPGs. I can't necessarily name who they are, um, but these partnerships have been very uh, beneficial, particularly for the CPG brands who are really hungry and seeking information to understand the consumer, uh, consumer behaviors. Um, many CPGs are facing several headwinds in, the, in their particular category. Um, declining brand loyalty, so people aren't necessarily wedded to particular brands anymore when they go into the grocery store. They're shopping for price. Uh, uh, these big CPGs and brands are competing with private label and with really a saturation in choice. The consumer has so many choices these days on the, sh on the supermarket shelf. Um, CPGs really are, are interested in understanding what is going to be that factor that uh, captures the interest of, of consumers, and that's something that um, Meredith is um, poised to help with. So um, this is a McKinsey study uh, that highlights the fact that the CPGs that have been able to be successful despite these headwinds are leveraging and utilizing data from a variety of sources. So they're getting data from their own proprietary sites as well as partnering with uh, companies like Meredith um, to augment or to help fill in the gaps in terms of what they understand uh, their consumers are doing. Okay, so all recipes. I. Has anybody in the room not used all recipes before? Because I think that's one of my favorite things about my job is when I tell people I get to work on all recipes, I'll have someone tell me, oh, I was just on the site the other day. I think yesterday during um, an analyst or an industry lunch, I, I sat down with someone and he said, oh, his wife had just made uh, lemon cookies from the site. and so. Um, always a great conversation starter, but uh, most people have, uh, if you cook, have used a recipe on all recipes. Um, in fact, 55 million households have used allrecipes.com. So uh, all recipes is the number one uh, food site um, in the United States. We have about 60,000 recipes, and like I said, um, we have about 3 billion sessions across these 60,000 recipes every year. Um, one of the, the factors that has allowed us to uh, leverage our data so successfully is the fact that we have had a long history in uh, managing the, the data in a very structured way, but also in terms of classifying that data. So we have a taxonomy of about 2,500 different attributes um, just on the food side. Um, and in addition to those attributes, there are about 60,000 unique ingredients that we're able to um, look at trends across. So the 2,500 attributes, the 60,000 unique ingredients gives us a lot of ways to summarize that data to understand what people are doing, what people are interested in when they're going to uh, prepare uh, food or meals for their family. Okay. So, um, Using all of this data, we started to think, okay, how do we start putting some structure around how we want to analyze and manage all of this data? Um, our sellers ask very creative questions. They come to us and say things like, I've got a meeting with Hellman's. Tell me everything you can about mayonnaise. Um, and uh, of course we say, okay, <laughs> there's probably a lot that we could say about mayonnaise. I mean, number one, you know, are people using it as an ingredient in the recipe? Are you just interested in, you know, are people making their own mayonnaise? You know, there was a lot of negotiation that we had to do as these questions were coming into our team. Uh, so we were doing a lot of very random analysis. We were uh, working on analysis for every seller, for every particular type of meeting they wanted. And we would come at them with, 
you know, giant workbooks of data, giant PowerPoints, and they would say, this is great, I really only need three bullet points, please. So we really had to say, okay, what is it that our sales team wants, and what are the um, business decisions or the, the things that are gonna close that deal? What, it, what is it that the advertiser wants to hear? And so we really bucketed our analysis to cover three areas. We wanted our insights to be able to inform the uh, the CPGs are creative in their advertising. So what creative, what messaging should they be including to um, reach the right audience with the right message? Content. So I said uh, All Recipes has been around for 20 years. I think All Recipes was one of the first um, online entities to have a native ad product. Um, they had it before it was called a native ad product, but if you are, let's say, Kellogg's and you want to have a Rice Krispie recipe on the internet, All Recipes is the place to do that. And so um, we have a lot of uh, recipes that are sponsored and um, really are originating from the brand. So uh, we, we decided that you know, a lot of the companies that we work with on the CPG side were really interested in knowing what kind of content should we uh, develop. Uh, we worked with um, an Italian pasta maker, and uh, they wanted to publish a recipe that included uh, duck as an ingredient. And we basically said, if you're trying to reach the typical American household, duck as an ingredient probably isn't the way you want to go, but here are uh, you know, 50 other ideas um, for the type of content you should create that would you know, reach the American consumer. And we thought, well, why not? put the duck recipe out there. There's no you know, problem with, with having that out there. So they did put the duck recipe out there and um, surprise, surprise, it was not the most popular recipe of the pasta recipes. But similarly, um, you know, we use the data to inform content decisions on the CPG side, but also product decisions. So um, you know, as I said, All Recipes reaches 55 million unique consumers in US households. Um, based on Comscore data, uh, our reach is about 20%. So one in five people online um, is on all recipes. So we know a lot about uh, what people are buying and preparing. So a lot of our CPG partners ask us about uh, information to help guide their product decisions. So, um, you know, we're proud to say that the problems we're able to solve go beyond just the advertising, the creative and the messaging, but really help inform um, these CPG clients around content strategy as well as product development. Okay, so we knew we wanted to have our analysis address these three business problems. Great. What we moved into then was realizing, okay, we have a lot of data in a lot of different places. Um, at the time, as I said, all of the work was highly manual. You had one analyst writing a query to get all of the mayonnaise uh, traffic and another analyst writing a similar but very different query to get at all of the mayonnaise content. And you ended up with two analysts with somewhat similar findings, but using very different methodology. So we really needed to standardize our process for getting these insights so they could be repeatable, um, because of course, you know, part of these partnerships are all about accountability, right? We wanna say, we helped you decide what content to produce. Let's actually see over time how this content is performing. So we needed to have standardized methods for being able to do the same analysis over and over and over again, regardless of you know, if the analyst was, was still with us, you know, two years later. Um, we had clickstream data from our web analytics platform. So we use Adobe and Google Analytics, but we also have proprietary databases. So on all recipes, when you uh, favorite a recipe or you submit a photo or a review, um, we capture those signals in um, a proprietary database. Those two systems did not talk to each other. So we did bring our clickstream data into a data warehouse, but the volume and the scale of that data, uh, could, it could not exist in the same database that we had um, this proprietary information about um, all recipes members. So two different data environments. Um, and the fact that, okay, 
we have the data, we're doing this analysis. It was very important for us to be able to make these findings actionable by the advertiser. So we had a different system that was used to manage other data collection to help us build um, custom uh, and niche segments. So our DMP, which was another uh, disconnected system. So we worked on designing this consumer insights framework that brought these pieces together to make sure that at the end of the analysis, we actually put something in front of our client or our partner to say, here's everything we can tell you about mayonnaise and here's what you should do about it. Okay. So the first iteration of this is what we called Nuggets 1.0. And hopefully this is, is um, easy to see. I don't know if it is. But the point here is not necessarily to see what's up here, but to see where we started with this more automated approach. So um, what we've got here is our first iteration uh, it solved the SQL problem because we wrote the SQL with our engineers one time. It lived in this workbook, so uh, you didn't necessarily need to figure out, you know, which analyst worked on it, where are their, uh, code, where's their uh, SQL files. It was embedded in this workbook. The problem with this is that um, it was highly static. So uh, there's visualizations, data in here, and some narrative, and a whole <laughs> bunch of annotations. Um, these were pretty high-level effort to produce. Uh, they were not easy to refresh. Um, but they got at the automation piece. We did, I think, a few hundred of these across um, different topics. Uh, but they were very canned. So almost every one of these looked just like this. Um, orange and blue at all recipes. We love orange. Um, but they were static. So uh, when another year rolled by, you had to uh, get back in there and refresh it. So the usefulness here was great because all of a sudden we had 200 of these that we could very quickly give to our sellers. If they had a meeting, let's say, with a, a candy or chocolate company, uh, they could have this almost immediately. This was very successful because, like I said, we went from two weeks to about a few days to be able to turn this around. I mean, uh, depending on who the seller was meeting with, we could tweak some of the narrative to make it more tailored to uh, the company that they were meeting with. Um, but we knew that this was kind of not meeting the potential that we had. So I said we had 2,500 different attributes, 60,000 ingredients, 60,000 recipes, having a few hundred of those uh, quick dashboards um, wasn't enough. Um, but to recap where we were with that iteration, yeah, we successfully created a whole bunch of uh, very uh, canned, dashboards that could be utilized and delivered very, very quickly. Um, we were not dealing with a ton of custom SQL. Uh, it was great for our sellers who uh, didn't have a whole lot of data expertise and some of our digital analysts who themselves didn't have a whole lot of technical expertise. It solved that problem. But what, what, quick, but what we quickly saw was that it didn't help us with emerging trends. So that one visualization was from 2015. Uh, the landscape after, you know, at 2015 to now has changed so dramatically. We see all kinds of new food trends. And so the fact that these things were very static um, was not meeting our, our stakeholder needs. Um, the delivery mechanism was PDF. So we would refresh them, PDF them, send them over an email. So again, um, very static data and uh, not customizable. So in the first phase, we solved this data problem. But what we saw was that we now were encountering what we call a domain problem. So we have analysts who are not necessarily experts in food. They may be experts in data. Um, this chocolate example was actually pretty interesting because uh, the analyst who was working on it uh, was from France. And Halloween and American candies and chocolates were not something that she was very familiar with. And so uh, there was actually uh, one trend around chocolate bark 
And I don't know if anybody here knows what chocolate bark is, but she most certainly did not. Uh, so she thought it was a, a typo. She thought it, it was chocolate bar, but chocolate bark is, is like a kind of like sheet pan chocolate where you can put like nuts and fruit and stuff in it. And it's very rustic and beautiful. You break it up and you've got these pieces of, of chocolate bark. And so she didn't know that was a thing, and um, it's, it's pretty common. So um, we wanted to be able to solve some of that domain problem in our next iteration. So our next iteration, Nuggets 2.0. We had a growing team. We had people that were definitely more technical, people that were ready uh, for better tools to do their analysis. And so Nuggets 2.0, our, our primary mission was to be able to unlock all of those attributes that we had access to. We didn't want to hand curate or hand select a couple hundred um, topics. We wanted to be able to uh, capitalize on the fact that we had all of this very rich uh, classified data and be able to look at combinations of those attributes but we wanted to also um, enable more of the self-service. So we wanted to make sure that we could uh, provide a solution for someone who is not very technical, who maybe isn't a Tableau expert um, or a, a database or SQL expert. Um, so our next iteration really broke out into two parallel layers. One being a presentation layer that had very standardized charts that allow you to uh, combine different attributes and also is updated regularly. And then a, dis a discovery layer. So we, had, we have a group of analysts who you know, have been over the course of the last few years becoming more expert in, in using Tableau. And so we wanted a discovery layer for them that allows them to use a Tableau desktop to connect to the Tableau data sources that we've published that summarizes all of this data. So we wanted to bring these two approaches to bear. Now, on that timeline slide, I said at one point we didn't have a whole lot of dev support. Um, with the increasing success of being able to deliver these insights um, to our sales team faster, uh, we were actually able to better plan this next round of iterations. So um, we were able to put together a team of data engineers, our um, domain experts, so the people on the editorial team who know food, who know that chocolate bark is a thing, um, <laughs> and uh, our stakeholders. And I think that's what was missing during our first iteration, is that we thought, we know what our stakeholders want, you know, we talk to them all the time. We're always sending stuff to them. They tell us, you know, of the stuff we sent, what worked, what didn't work. Um, but we didn't involve them in the, in the design. And so that was one of the limitations of that first iteration, Nuggets 1.0. And that was something we wanted to address in uh, the next phase or in this 2.0 phase. So uh, we were able to secure the, t uh, the time of our sellers, and that's a really difficult thing to do, to iterate on the design. And the project plan, it's not really easy to see what it says here, but they're really, I think, two different tracks. So the presentation layer, as I said, and the discovery layer. Um, the presentation layer, I think we started with that, and I actually think, think looking back now, I don't know if this was intentional, but I'd like to say that we, we as, as part of our strategy, we started with the presentation layer, and it enabled us to get things in front of the sellers faster so they could actually see the results of our work um, while all of this other engineering was happening on the back end. Um, sellers don't have patience for hearing about how long it takes to reprocess data. They don't care about that. They just want to see what the heck is happening with mayonnaise, right? So. We started with the approach of, of starting with the front end while the back end work was happening uh, a little bit later, but I think in some ways um, in parallel. Um, but having that dedicated engineering support was really critical. So when we started with Nuggets 1.0, every query was its own unique query. We did not have a whole lot of um, 
summaries across all of those recipes and across all of those attributes. So uh, we spent a little bit more time engineering what this process would look like. So, you know, I said that the data existed in Clickstream. It existed in these proprietary databases. Uh, our taxonomy is a living thing. Every day, our taxonomy team is creating uh, new branches of the hierarchy, identifying new attributes, so it's changing. So as, as the uh, taxonomy is changing, as all of the signals are changing, the clickstream data is coming in, we had to be able to figure out a way to effectively munge all this stuff together, so bring it all together into an environment. So, you know, what we've got represented here in terms of the different uh, levels of the orange data is just, you know, where the data is coming from and the different processes. So when a new recipe uh, enters the database, it is incorporated into these summaries. When new attributes are created, we then um, assign or associate the content to those new um, attributes in the taxonomy and build a large summary of all of those attributes, the recipes, and all of those um, signals from page views, visits, to how many times someone said they made that recipe, uh, to how many times that recipe was printed or shared. And then we put Tableau on top of it. All right. So um, I'm going to go into the demo of this particular solution now. And my fingers are crossed. I, I was going to try and do it on Tableau Server, but I decided uh, that was not a good idea. So <laughs> I've got a package workbook. And I think this is a great also um, demo, uh, considering that I myself am not a Tableau expert. So I'm wondering why now this is not showing up. OK, there we go. There we go. All right. Still, the resolution doesn't look great, but we'll make do. We'll make do. OK, so this is the Nuggets 2.0 platform. It has those 60,000 recipes sitting behind it uh, with those 2,500 different attributes. Um, so bear with me if it's slow. And I did try and pick uh, some uh, filters that didn't seem to take too long. But the very first thing that you do when you uh, start up this platform is you begin building your universe. So we've taken the attributes in our taxonomy hierarchy and basically built them as a breadcrumb. So uh, you can go down, you know, you can go down the list and pick uh, a particular attribute. Here I've got comfort food. And then uh, I've got a subfilter here that lets me uh, look at comfort food by item type. And in our taxonomy, item type is uh, like a recipe type. So um, we've got item types appearing on this scatter plot. So the scatter plot uh, maps page views along the vertical axis and year over year growth on the horizontal axis. So what this enables us to do is actually look at in the comfort food category, so any recipe that has been uh, classified as comfort food, uh, we're able to see those item types showing up here. And uh, the size of the circle indicates how many recipes uh, meet those criteria. Uh, towards the top, I mean, the higher it is, you know, that recipe is at the top means the higher volume of page views. And the farther to the right on the horizontal axis, the greater the year over year growth. And so one use case for this might be we have a seller who has uh, a meeting with, let's say, um, a sausage manufacturer. And the sausage manufacturer wants to know what kinds of trends are we seeing in comfort food because that's their demographic. They're not interested in reaching people who are into healthy living, clean eating. They want to reach the people who are looking for comfort food. And so we would be able to use this to say, OK, 
uh, strand and ribbon pasta seems to be an area that uh, has high volume and some pretty good growth uh, in the comfort food arena. So let's take a look and see what else we might be able to tell this seller about comfort food and strand and ribbon pasta. So we can uh, click this and then uh, move on to see the list of recipes uh, that fit that category. So um, here we go with the status bar and my fingers are definitely crossed. Okay, that was, that was pretty fast. <laughs> in, sitting in the hotel room, that was not nearly that fast, so phew. Okay, so strand and ribbon pasta, comfort food, world's best lasagna, and I don't know if um, world's best lasagna actually really is, I think, the world's best lasagna. It is absolutely delicious, and I think this is one uh, that the Washington Post did a story on being like the most popular recipe of all time on the internet. So there you go, sausage maker. There's the recipe that you want to be uh, advertising on. Um, so you can click the recipe and see if it uh, is popular for particular holidays. Uh, so this lets you see, is there growth in the week uh, of a given holiday compared to the prior four weeks? Because on all recipes, we tend to see that for holidays, recipes spike the week of the holiday. So apparently Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year is very popular for lasagna. I don't love turkey and Thanksgiving's coming up. I wish I was having world's best lasagna, but my family loves turkey, so. Um, the other interesting thing here is for those selections, we highlight what other uh, attributes uh, does that collection of recipes fall into? Because a lot of advertisers, you know, they don't want to just advertise on world's best lasagna. They want to know what are some of the adjacent categories that uh, audience who's, who might be interested in world's best lasagna might also be looking at these other areas. So um, we can then look at, okay, what other attributes is this recipe related to? And these can actually, um, based on the way that we set up the, the data on our data layer, can be utilized as attributes in our DMP. So we can create um, segments based on these kinds of uh, categorizations, making this data then actionable for the advertiser. So there is one use case. Okay, so I wanted to also show, so when we do this, we've got to look for things with, that fall into that upper right quadrant, you know, high volume, high growth, Sometimes as an analyst, you kind of like to dig in and find things that are a little bit unexpected or weird. So, you know, I didn't want to wing it, but I did find something that was interesting. And if we have anybody in the Midwest here, I'm going to lean on you to tell me what this thing is. So I was poking around this afternoon, and I am going to look at primary meal type. So, uh, you know, when we're all out of Las Vegas and back home and have to face the rigors of day-to-day -day life, we're going to have to figure out what the heck to make for dinner. Um, <laughs> if you had this tool at your, in your home, you could be making whatever the most popular uh, dinner is. Um, oops, actually, I should have done it over here. Um, oh, boy. Okay, so we've got primary meal dinner. I want to look at this based on geography, or uh, ethnic or geographic. Sorry, I know, I know this is probably painful for people who are good at Tableau <laughs> to watch me do this. Like, pause the updates, pause the updates. Um, but I, I also, like, the, there's a lot of pride here in me watching this uh, status meter because I'm like, that's way faster than it was before. We would stare at this thing, um, like, taking, like, minutes. And so being able to see it refresh like that is uh, so, so fun. So I think I've got another filter in here that I didn't want. So let me turn that off. Uh, nope, nope, that's it. That's it. Okay. So let's see. I'm wondering if we had an update because uh, we'll, we'll look at this. So 
earlier when I ran this based on the parameters I had, I did a dinner and Iowa showed up. And I thought, wow, I wonder what is trending in Iowa um, that had high growth plus uh, relatively high volume. And, um, and this, I really want to know what this is because I didn't really have a chance to look it up. But there was a dish called Runza. Oh, somebody knows what Runza is. I heard somebody say. What is Runza? Okay. 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 Well, I, I tell you, that's one of the things that I love um, seeing in these platforms are those regional things. So, okay, this is Wisconsin, and thank goodness. So, Wisconsin is not one that I looked at, but there are definitely things here showing up in Wisconsin that. I am not necessarily familiar with, and so maybe if anybody is here from Wisconsin, can anybody vouch for this list of recipes? So we've got fry bread, Wisconsin bratwurst, pierogies, uh, something called a Sheboygan grill. I mean, I know what a, a brat is, but Sheboygan, Sheboygan grilled brats. Okay, okay. So are you from Wisconsin? Yes, okay, yes, okay. So, uh, fry bread, number one in Wisconsin? Okay. <laughs> For somebody it is. For somebody it is. All right. Fry bread, it's bread that's fried. Okay. Oh, so it's, it's like a funnel, s similar to a funnel cake. So you have dough or batter that you drop into a deep fryer. Okay. Okay. Cheese is fried. Okay. Well, here we've got Wisconsin five cheese bake. So maybe that's the healthy version uh, for those of us who try and watch our, our waistline. But booyah chicken, there you go. All right. So so many use cases that this has um, been able to fill in our team, and it's great for endless hours of entertainment. Uh, so um, I've got 10 more minutes. I would love to field some questions. Otherwise, I could stand up here all day and dig into this data, and I'm sure I could get some people also interested in doing that with me. But any questions? Yes. Uh, you mean to like in Tableau Public or? Um, I'm, well, so earlier today I yeah. had that session where Airbnb was the data that you can download off of Airbnb oh. and like play with it and build your own dashboards. Yeah, and yeah. We don't right now, and actually, you know, I, I think one of the things that we're working towards is being able to supply this data to people who are excited to experiment with the data because we have um, in our data warehouse uh, recipe data starting from 2007, so there's a huge amount of data. Um, actually, it's, it was even very unusual for us um, until very recently to start even sharing things like with the, the labels on there because we were, were very protective of you know, our, the, some of the volume of our data. But um, we don't currently, um, but it's definitely something that we've, um, we've been interested in. And we've even worked with some university students and provided them data to kind of go to town on um, building recommendation engines. So not currently, but something we would love to be able to do. Yes. Uh, well, you know, you know, I, I wish we could tell when someone actually opened the magazine, but 6 a.m. on parents.com, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm much more familiar with some of the all recipes, time-based patterns, um, but we see a lot of interesting things around, yeah, when people are consuming certain content types. So 
uh, we looked at uh, when are people looking at cocktail recipes, and it was so fascinating because we saw that there were, were spikes in co cocktail recipes around 1 a.m., and our theory was is that uh, you were out at the bar drinking and wanted to know what the heck was that that I just consumed. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we do look at uh, client side, uh, hour of day data across our sites, and consumer journey and pathing is definitely something that you know we're we're exploring more, more, um, more in depth. But yep, yep, we do see people throughout the day. Second question. Yep. Yes. 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 Uh, our product team thought that too, and so uh, they are doing um, some more uh, location-based targeting. So we're starting with uh, using our historical data to seed uh, some of the location-based data. Because yeah, I mean, if you, it would be really boring if I showed you all of like the most popular recipes on all recipes. It's always meatloaf, it's always chicken, and it's always uh, fluffy pancakes. So yeah, yeah, totally right. Like looking at this stuff, being able to drill down by geography is where the really interesting stuff comes up. But yeah, uh, check out allrecipes.com. I, I don't, I can't remember when that feature is launching, but we are going to be, you know, looking at location data and surfacing what's popular in your area. Yeah. In the back here, with the W hat or LV hat, yeah. <laughs> uh, great presentation. Thank you. Whoa! And I don't even know you, so that's great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Are, are you also giving them information if you have an agreement with them <coughs> to advertise on our recipes? Or do you have a data service available? Yeah, so we don't have a data service available. I mean, um, the majority of what we deliver is based on, you know, larger advertising engagements with uh, Meredith as a whole. So. Uh, a lot of times when we have big advertisers um, that have engaged in some kind of direct sales agreement with them, we offer a lot of these sort of consultative services as a part of the overall engagement. So um, they don't, like, they can't log into this on Tableau server and kind of self-serve their own uh, trending, but yeah, we use it as, as kind of part of managing that relationship with the, the big consumer package good partners that we work with. for us in this space. Uh, well, when I mentioned headwinds, I, I was talking um, about the CPGs in particular and why they want to partner with us. But you know, I would say our internal headwinds as a publisher, I mean, are things like the fact that you know, the majority of our traffic comes from search engines. So we are, you know, always struggling with making sure that we're, you know, building these engaging experiences and building loyalty across uh, our audience that we recognize as return visitors. So engagement is a huge um, uh, focus for us, primarily because getting that transient user in from a search engine who doesn't care if they're on allrecipes.com or food52, um, you know, making sure that we're building these experiences so that people continue to come back. Yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So um, several years ago, we launched what we called an All Recipes All-Star Program, where we identified our most engaged, loyal members. And so uh, 
there is a group of people that are that have so much all recipes love it was a little bit scary like there is one woman who got an all recipes tattoo and um <laughs> no i'm not kidding i'm not kidding uh, we invited uh, for our 15th anniversary these brand enthusiasts to come to the office and oh my gosh, we were floored um, by just how enthusiastic and how much they'd followed the brand. And I mean, it's evident across the site. So, you know, we have 60,000 recipes, uh, 3 billion page views every year, but it is this core of about I would say it's probably about 10,000 to 20,000 people who su submit the bulk of the photos, submit the bulk of the reviews, and it's those people, that small group, that we are constantly just you know, wanting to take care of. Like literally, many of them have the phone number of people in our office that when they're upset about something or need a cooking tip, like they get on the phone and they can you know, call Elizabeth in Seattle to talk through her cooking challenge. Um, but yeah, influencers are a huge part of it, and we have a social media team that really does take care of our social media influencers, but then this core group of members who produce so much of our content, because all recipes is, is completely, um, are for the most part, user-generated content. Yeah, yeah. Right here. Oh, it's a fast food, and so they're trying. So it's a copycat recipe. Would, okay. But the, the way it looks, it, people they would do a killing in Vegas. Like, I mean, it would, you put that next to fast food. So, so <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, uh, maybe I will give that tip to yeah. our next uh, CPG that wants yeah, to know yeah. the next product that they should uh, launch. So, yeah. <laughs> so I have a couple questions. Um, you guys are sitting on a mountain of data, uh, and data that that you know you can pass uh, to your users. Um, is there uh, on the roadmap? I haven't been on the site lately, but yeah. uh, is there on the roadmap uh, a plan to uh, allow users to, to query recipes using their own ingredients at home? So, like, if I'm if I'm stuck in a snowstorm, uh -huh. on the, I, sh I shouldn't even say that. Yeah, yeah. Charlotte, where I live, two two snowflakes fall, and the whole city shut down. So and, that's and like Seattle, that's, and that's including all of the the trucks that drive to and, and uh, deliver to yeah. the, the grocery. Yeah. So. Um, so all the shelves are, are bare. So if I'm at home and I have, you know, uh, I want to, you know, bake something or something like that, I have flour, sugar, eggs, and water. I, I can query those four ingredients to get and get yeah. whatever's whatever's the recipe. Yeah. Uh, actually, um, we on our product roadmap, I believe for this year, uh, we are are building out a feature called "What Can I Make with What I Have," and it's got this crazy acronym and that's how we refer to it at all recipes but yeah absolutely um, right now there is a feature on the site where you can say I want recipes with these ingredients but not these ingredients it, it, it's not exactly what you're describing but um, it, it approximates it but yeah absolutely that's something we're working on oh yeah Yeah. So it's out there. It's just it probably takes a, a lot to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the second question, um, I detected a little bit of uh, animosity towards the color orange. <laughs> <laughs> No, I am not anti-orange, but if you're ever in Seattle and you want to come visit our office, you will you will see what I mean. Everything is orange. Everything is. I, I, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and a lot of our visualizations for a long time were orange and brown, and so you kind of, you know, not always the best food colors, orange and brown. So, all right. Um, I I don't know if I'm going to get cut off, but I'll take one one more question back here. Uh, 
Uh, we, in our review data, there's a huge amount of substitution information that our, our audience uh, has actually supplied. Um, we did with a partner um, an ingredient substitution kind of uh, predictive model, like an experiment trying to predict, okay, if you substitute, if you uh, took out one ingredient, what might be another ingredient be that would be a good substitute? So we have flavor categorizations right now to enable some of that more uh, predictive capability. So yeah, we do have a flavor uh, branch of the taxonomy that has things like sweet, savory, spicy, herby, um, umami I think is in there. So yeah, we do classify the content on, a, on flavor profile. All right, well, it is four o'clock. Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun for me. I hope it was fun for you.